So the American Revolution is significant to the French Revolution because it basically caused the revolution and gave it its, its inspiration. Um, basically, the Louis the Sixteenth um, wanted to support the Americans in their revolution because he recently lost a war against Britain in the Seven Years' War, so he wanted to get back at them by forming an alliance with the French. Um, this wasn't a really good idea at the time because France was really poor, the people were starving to death, and Louis was spending all this money supporting the Americans, funding their troops, financially supporting them, and they this put France in debt. And by, no, in 1789, they were 4 billion livres in debt, okay? So when Louis XVI sent his troops over there to help the Americans fight, the troops came back to France bringing back enlightenment ideas and inspiration and encouragement to revolution. And this started the French Revolution because people got the ideas of standing up for themselves and standing up against their leader, which was Louis XVI. So under the advice of Charles Cullen, his financial minister, the king called a meeting of representatives of the first and second estates, which is called the Assembly of Notables. There were about 144 notables that he called to the assembly with the intention of giving them financial reform and having them pass it. Cologne knew that the parliaments wouldn't pass his reforms because they were very liberal and wanted to change the tax structure. Um, they included giving the upper classes a voice in lawmaking in exchange for abolishing the first estate's right not to pay taxes. So the significance of the Assembly of Notables that was that passing these reforms could have helped France quite a bit with their financial crisis. And eventually their problems led to the Estates General, which eventually led to the Tennis Court Act and the French Revolution. In 1789, for the first time since 1614, the king called the Estates General, which was a meeting of the first, second, and third estates. Um, the first and second estates had 300 delegates, and the third estate um, had 600, but... The third estate had the most representatives, however, they were always outnumbered and voted by the first and the second estate because the king wanted to count by estates instead of like a head count individually. So they'd always be outvoted two to one. Right. Okay, so this was significant because it led to the tennis court oath in the formation of the National Assembly. And the third estate formed the National Assembly because they were not being re represented fully in the estates general and they would always be outvoted by the first and second estates. Tennis Court Oath um, was caused when Louis XVI was angered because he thought the Third Estate was challenging his royal, royal authority. On June 19th, 1789, um, Louis was encouraged by his friends and advisors and family to lock the normal meeting house of the Third Estate. And guards were placed at the door and the Third Estate was forced to convene in a nearby indoor tennis court. So, on June 20th, 1789, 576 members of the Third Estate swore that they would not separate until they had established a new constitution for France. And this was the tennis court. Oh, yes, so, while all the, the riots and revolutions were going on, the king started getting really threatened and afraid for his life, so he eventually fleed and attempted to escape from France. And he, he was advised by many advisors to flee initially, but he didn't want to leave initially. He wanted to stay. He thought that was what the king should do. But by 1791, there was much more violence and unrest, and he found that his life was threatened and he feared for his life. 
The king also thought that he might be able to get help if he fled, and on June 20th, 1791, he left Paris. Um, their destination was Montmédy. Mont 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 yeah, Montmédy. Um, a royalist town, and he hoped that Mary Antoinette's family um, and the Austrian military would help them in fleeing France. However, however they were caught at Varennes, and 30, um, which is 30 miles away from the France-Austrian border. The king and queen were arrested and returned to Paris, and they were housed in the Tuileries prison. Mm -hmm. And this was like a really bad time for Louis because this even got the people even angrier at him for fleeing and leave France just alone to deal with the problems that he caused. When the king attempted to leave Paris, it undermined his authority and the trust that the people had in him. They, and it fueled the radical phase of the revolution. was the monarch of France during this time of the French Revolution. He was a good father and he was a good man and husband, but he wasn't a very good leader. And that was because he was indecisive, weak, and he spent all of France's funds and finance on himself and stupid things like war and his wife. So this led to France's poverty, and yes, this made the people very unhappy and what caused the French Revolution. So Marie Antoinette was the king's wife. She was also an Austrian, and this, and she had a lot of political influence over her husband. Um, it cast more and more suspicion on the king and made him tr untrustworthy to the people because her decisions and her influence on the king was kind of biased to her own country and this eventually um, provided evidence when the king was charged with treason. And France was at war with Austria so when Marie Antoinette, well, Marie Antoinette was an Austrian so they made, it caused the people to distrust the king even more than they already did. Marianne was Louis' financial minister from 1787 through August 1788. He was significant because he was unable to deal with the rising financial problems, and he attempted to pass financial reforms, but was unsuccessful with that. And eventually he resigned, which brought in Jacques Necker. So Charles Alexandre de Cologne was Louis XVI's financial advisor from 1783 to 1787 and he recognized the need for extreme reforms in France and it was actually his idea to convene the Assembly of Notables which refused his reforms. Um, Cologne was most significant because he assessed France's national debt to more than a hundred million livres. Um, and this led to the Estates General as an attempt to fix these problems. So Jock Necker was Louis XVI's financial advisor from 1776 to 1781. Um, he attempted to help France's financing by taking out loans instead of raising taxes, which got him support from the people. While these reforms were somewhat successful, um, he was, he was fired when he did a full assessment of France's financial situation. However, he was rehired in 1788 after Cologne and Brienne's terms as financial ministers in an attempt to save the monarchy from their financial ruin, basically. He was also a very popular figure with the people, and, which was significant because rumors spread that he might be dismissed, leading to rumors even more spreading that his dismissal was 
paving the way for a counterattack among the royalty. And that led to the storming of the Bastille. I used to rule the world, Caesar rise when I gave the word. Now in the morning I sleep alone, sweep the streets I used to own. So the National Assembly from June 20th to July 9th, and the National Constituent Assembly from July 9th to 1791, were different groups. The National Assembly was formed on June 20th with the Tennis Court Oath. An event that happened during its lifetime would be that it was confronted by the king who gave them a speech and ordered them to back down. However, they refused to back down and on July 9th, 1789, they reconstituted themselves as the National Constituent Assembly. The National Constituent Assembly is commonly known as the National Assembly Bastille on July 14, 1789 um, was caused by the king's attempt to increase troops in Paris, which led to a lot of public anger. A mob then attacked the Bastille, um, which was a royal armory in prison. The mob wanted to free the prisoners and also to get gunpowder and ammunition and weapons, which was significant because the fall of the Bastille symbolized that royal authority was collapsing and that Louis was losing his hold on the people. The common people had saved the poor guys bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie. from the king's wrath and kept the revolution alive. The Great Fear was a time period where the peasants were really panicking because of the rumors that the king was going to overthrow the revolution. They feared that the foreign troops would invade and there would be an aristocratic plot against them. And this had a pretty significant impact because the National Assembly then passed laws and in the August decrees in which they tried to calm the peasants down by making certain concessions such as abolishing feudalism. Mm -hmm. Decrees were one of the first acts of the National Assembly, and this was brought on by pres <laughs> peasant unrest on the countryside. Um, they abolished feudalism in France and gave the peasants several more um, several more rights. They also abolished um, fiscal privileges of the nobles, clergy, towns, and provinces. And the church gave up the right to collect tithes from the population, which was important because this had originally been a great source of the clergy's wealth. Mm -hmm. They abolished law courts run by the nobility, uh, abolished unpaid work by peasants, and abolished the... Taxes. Ta peasants taxes. normally had to pay for their landlord. So this basically, what this did was took away the privileges that the first and second estate once had and gave the third estate more of the rights that they deserved and were fighting for all along. So for the, the purpose of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen was to create a foundation for the National Assembly's ideas and government. It was the beginning of establishing a new constitution for France, which they wanted all along. And the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen drew on the De American Declaration of Independence, and it stated that all men have the rights of equality, property, and liberty, security, basically sim very similar ideas to the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. This document banned imprisonment without trial, 
and ordered that taxation had to be fair to all. And it said that the decisions should all be beneficial to the people. And it also included free speech and freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. Marquis de Lafayette was a French nobleman who served in the American War for Independence. He, he favored moderate reform, and he was significant because he helped draw up the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. It's not the same. Honoré Gabriel Riquetti, Count of Mirabeau, was the leader of the National Assembly who favored the lower classes' rights. He had moderate revolution revolutionary ideas and wanted a constitutional monarchy. He was also a secret advisor to Louis and Marie Antoinette and after the revolution broke out and he died that was a, quite a blow to his reputation with the people. Um, he was suggested to be an intermediary between the king and the revolutionaries but the king and the court distrusted him so he was not granted that position. Basically, he was significant because he was a pretty important leader in the National Assembly. Um, Olympe de Gouges was a champion of women's rights. She wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen, and she was a response to the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And she demanded that women have the same rights of men. John Chauvin Bailey was the president of the Third Estate in the Estates General. He led the tennis court oath and became the mayor of Paris after the fall of Bastille. Uh, Governor Marquis Bernard de Launay, he was the leader of the Bastille's forces. Uh, he ordered a ceasefire which prevented general massacre, but he was eventually killed by the mob and his head was paraded through the streets on a pike, which was a symbol of the fall of the monarchy and the Bastille. The Constitution of 1791 was in September of 1791. And its main goal, or the main goal of the Constitute Assembly was to create a new constitution. The Consti Constitution created a constitutional monarchy, and it was a reform, however it wasn't a very strong reform. Like it, it didn't kings, kill the king right. or remove him, it just sort of decreased his power. Right. Uh, the king still had royal veto powers and his ability to select his ministers. This created the Legislative Assembly by the Constitution. The Legislative Assembly consisted of 745 representatives, which were elected by active citizens, which were over 25 paying taxes that equaled three days unskilled labor. And they voted for electors, who were men paying taxes that equaled 10 days labor, which elected the members of the Legislative Assembly. The Legislative Assembly had none of the previous members of the National Assembly and was comprised of more radical members. The Declaration of Pilnitz was enacted on August 27, 1791, and it was issued by Emperor Leopold II of Austria and King Frederick William I of Prussia. The other monarchies were afraid that the revolutionary ideas would spread to their countries, which mean that their lives are in danger, so they wanted the king's power to be restored. Um, However, they two were suspicious of each other, so they couldn't really team up and do it. Back in France, the king was accused of plotting with the other monarchs, and this increased the people's anger at the king and mistrust of him. The legis 
legislative assembly declared war on Austria on April 20th, 1792, and this was due to France's enthusiasm for war. Counter-revolutionaries believed that fighting a war would calm the revolutionaries down, the radical revolutionaries. They hoped that by defeating the Austrians, they would be able to reinstate the old regime. And the revolutionaries also wanted to spread revolutionary ideas throughout Europe as well. And this was significant because France lost pretty badly in the beginning of the war. And this led to a frantic search for scapegoats, some to blame. And eventually, public unrest led to a mob attack on the royal palace and the imprisonment of the king and the radical phase of the revolution. The attack on the royal palace occurred on August 10, 1792, and this was due to military, military failures and economic issues, which led to this massive public unrest. In August 1792, a mob comprised of radical political groups stormed the royal palace, arrested the king, and forced the legislative assembly to create the national convention. This was important because it kind of started the um, revolutionary and radical phase of the revolution. It was led by the sans-culottes, which means basically the common worker. The sans-culottes led the attack on the royal palace in 1792, and they were the common urban workers who, radical left-wingers that wanted a complete change in the government. And the attack on the Royal Palace was really significant because it was the first radical event that leading to the radical phase of the revolution, the National Convention, the Committee of Public Safety. The Brunswick Manifesto on July 25th, 1792 was issued by Charles William Ferdinand, the Duke of Brunswick, and he issued a proclamation that ordered that France restore the monarchy and that the royal family not be harmed. Like the Declaration of Pilnitz, this document made it seem that the king was conspiring with all the other monarchs, which bred fear and anger in the population and made them trust the king less. Honey, that's what love's about. and one of the signers of the Declaration of Pilnitz. He, among other monarchs, feared the revolution and wanted the king back on the throne. King Frederick Wilhelm II was the king of Prussia and one of the signers of the Declaration of Pilnitz. He made the main reason for his contribution in this Declaration of Pilnitz was that he was afraid that the revolution would spread to his country and then he would lose power as well. And the sans culottes were a group of common workers whose name meant without knee breaches, literally. Um, they prided themselves for being ordinary workers and not having fancy clothing, thus the name without knee breaches. And they also led the attack on the Legislative Assembly, which le led to the National Convention. Jacques-Pierre Brissot was a member of the Legislative Assembly, and his followers are, were originally called the Brissantins, but at, came to be called the important political group, the Girondins. And he was a strong proponent of war and was the prominent leader of war against Austria and the declaration of war. And he was important because of the Girondins' moderate policies and how they came to be the most important, one of the most important political groups. Count Carnot was an engineer and mathematician before turning to politics and the revolution. He had the idea of using conscriptions in the army, which was important because it seemed it increased France's army from 650,000 to 1.5 million in less than a year. 
He also organized food and weapons for that huge force, and he was known as the organizer of Victor. Terror between 1792 to 1794, the Jacobins were in control of the National Convention, and at this time they used the Reign of Terror to consolidate their powers. Robespierre, who was a leader of the Jacobins and the Committee of Public Safety during this time, was executing anyone who he thought was suspected of being an enemy against the revolution. September 1792, there was a massacre of prisoners in Paris. These prisoners were suspected of conspiring to rise up and join in a counter-revolution. On January 21st, 1793, King Louis XVI was executed after being put on trial and voted by a very close vote. He was guillotined, which was important because France was now proclaimed a republic. In 1793, the new calendar was introduced, the revolutionary calendar. The months were renamed, and 1792 on September 22nd was the official first year of the calendar. There was a 10-day week, and they got one day off every week to attend the Temple of Reason which is what the churches were re-christened. And this was important because it was it showed Robespierre's attempts to secularize France and get and remove religion. On July 28, 1794, the National Convention executed Robespierre along with many other Jacobin leaders. This marked the end of the Reign of Terror and was um, an attempt for a new start. So the Girondins were basically the moderates from south of France. They supported the rights of the provinces to influence revolutionary movements. Basically, they wanted the king to have less power, but they didn't want to get rid of him completely. The Jacobins, who are formed in Paris, they later organized in the provinces and grew more radical as the revolution progressed. And the Jacobins were the political club that dominated throughout the reign of terror and the chaos, but the Girondins were the club that they deposed to get there much more moderate. Maximilian Robespierre was a lawyer that got to be elected to represent the Third Estate in the Estates General in 1789. He despised the monarchy and he believed that France should become a republic. He was also one of the main leaders in the Reign of Terror and the Committee of Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety was an established government supported by Robespierre to give more power to the Jacobins and powers to supervise military and legal affairs. Still believe in George Danton was the initial leader of the Committee of Public Safety. He was killed by Robespierre in 1794 when he began to urge a more moderate policy. So basically, he was killed by Robespierre when he was like, hey, you gotta stop all this killing. reaction was basically the period of time after the reign of terror. This was when the leaders of the Committee of Public Safety were executed and the leaders included Robespierre.
the directory shut down, the Jacobin Club and all churches reopened and this brought peace back to France. The Constitution of 1795 created a new governmental structure with a bicameral legislature, meaning that there were two houses, the lower house, the Council of 500, with 500 members, and an upper house called the Council of Elders, with 250 members that were over 50 years old and were widowed or married. Um, the Council of Elders could reject or accept the laws that the Council of 500 proposed. And the executive power lay in the Directory, which is a five-man group ele elected by the Council of Elders from a list that was created by the Council of 500. So they were basically the true power, these five men. And it was five men because they really wanted to avoid having a single person be in power. The whiff of grape shot occurred on October 5th, 1795. It happened when a young General Napoleon defeated a mob attack on the directory by using his command of artillery. This event was significant because it made Napoleon trustworthy to the directory and it encouraged them to give him more power. Get away when I need it most because I could find I could The conspiracy of Equals Rebellion in 1796 was when the Jacobins attempted to overthrow the directory in a plot led by Great Gracias Babouf. They had a newspaper that spread their ideas and they began to gather weapons. However, the plot was revealed by the police and its leaders were arrested and Babouf was executed. The Treaty of Campo Formio was signed on October 17, 1797, and it was signed by Napoleon and Count Ludwig von. And it ended the war with Austria. It shifted some lands from Austria to France and ended Napoleon's campaign in Italy. But more importantly, it made Napoleon even more famous and it allowed him to pursue his other political ambitions. If I keep it up, I know that I can fly. Gracious Babouf, or as his actual name was, Francois Noël Babouf, was a publisher who led the Conspiracy of Equals Rebellion. And he was a radical, um, wanted to overthrow the directory, and he was executed for his role in the rebellion. Rob was one of the members of the directory, and he worked with Napoleon to defeat the attack in 1795 of the Whip of Grape shot, which led to Napoleon's power. Yeah. was the president of the Legislative Assembly and then a member of the Directory. He served as Interior Minister for the Directory and he created the first exhibitions of art and industry. Jean-Francois Rebel was a member of the Directory as well and previously the President of the National Assembly. He was a Republican and an anti-Semitic. He opposed the citizenship of the Jews in 1791. Revelier Le Pope was a member of the Directory. He helped to draw up the Constitution of 1795 and he was virtually anti-Christian and eventually forced off the consulate. On November 9, 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte took advantage of the Directory's many problems in his large popularity and staged a coup d'etat. He formed a new government and a new constitution. The constitution created the government in which executive power was held by three con consuls, of which Napoleon was the first consul. And this was important because as first consul he had huge control over lawmaking, the army, foreign affairs, as well as being able to appoint members of the bureaucracy. 
which eventually led to him naming himself Emperor, Consul for Life, then Emperor. In 1801, Napoleon Bonaparte made peace with the Catholic Church with a document entitled The Concordat of 1801. He att attempted to re-establish a good relationship with the Catholic Church, a relationship that had been destroyed previously by the civil constitution of the clergy back in 1790. Under the Concordat of 1801, the Pope was allowed to remove bishops in France, but the state kept its right to nominate bishops. The church could also have processions and reopen seminaries. This was more beneficial for Napoleon, however, than the Pope, because the Pope agreed not to raise a fuss about lands that the government had confiscated by the civil constitution of the clergy in 1790. Catholicism did not become the state religion, but merely the religion of the majority. The Concordat of 1801 was significant because it restored a good relationship with the Catholic Church that had been missing for more than 10 years. The Civil Code was something Napoleon codified for France's 300 legal systems, and he condensed it into seven codes of law. The Civil Code was the most important of the seven, and it solidified the revolution's ideas by recognizing everyone's equality, religious freedom, property rights, and more. However, it also removed some of the revolutionary gains, and such as laws facilitating divorce and laws that allowed male and female children to inherit property in the same way. Under the civil code, women were less equal than men. They were treated as minors in lawsuits and could be imprisoned and divorced easily if they were caught in adultery. Under Napoleon's rule, tax collection became much more efficient. He created a system with professional tax collectors that were paid by the state. These tax collectors would collect from each taxpayer individually. Most importantly, there were absolutely no tax exemptions due to statuses like first estate, second estate, third estate that were in the Ancien regime. Although these changes have been pre present in the 1789 revolution, Napoleon put them into practice and made them work. His tax structure was effective as by 1802. He was able to claim that France had a budget balance budget. This was significant because France had been in financial trouble for many years and many governments had failed to deal with it, but Napoleon took major steps to fixing the problem. During Napoleon's reign, he also took away many liberties. Out of France's 73 newspapers, he shut down 60 of them, and all writings had to be inspected by the government before they could be published. His response for people that wrote about how bad his government was and denounced his rule was exile. For example, uh, Germain de Salle wrote many pamphlets denouncing his rule as tyrannical, and he had her exiled to Germany where she continued to write. This was significant because it eventually led to his becoming an emperor of France and having a tight control over France. Napoleon Bonaparte was a general who worked his way up into power and popularity by winning military engagements. He used cunning tactics and verbal persuasion to inspire public interest in him. He also earned the trust of the Directory when he saved them from the 1795 revolution with the whiff of grape shot. He came to power in 1799, building on his public enthusiasm for him and his military victories with the coup d'etat, and eventually became the Emperor of France in 1804. Emmanuel Joseph Sias, also known as Abbey Sias, was the author of What is the Third Estate, an anti ancien regime pamphlet. Abbey Sias helped organize the COPE of 1799 and served on the consulate with Napoleon. He was quickly knocked down to figurehead status while Napoleon assumed the real power. Jean 
Pierre Roger Ducot, like Sayus, was a consul that was eclipsed by Napoleon's power. He and Sayus were elected to the consulate, but Napoleon's growing power as first consul completely dominated the other two. Pope Pius VII was the Pope who signed the Concordat of 1861 with Napoleon. Napoleon paid him to come to France and participate in the coronation of Napoleon as Emperor. However, Napoleon crowned himself despite making the Pope travel to France. Jacques-Louis David was a propaganda painter during the French Revolution. He served as Napoleon's like court propaganda painter uh, during his rule, and he painted many propaganda paintings such as uh, Death of Marat uh, and the painting of the Tennis Court Oath, and all these paintings were magnified and they were altered in some way to portray a favorable image of what had occurred. <laughs> 